Hej och välkomna till Goto 10, en mötesplats för internetrelaterad uh, kunskapsutbyte och innovation. Vad roligt att se att vi är så många här idag. Jag hoppas att ni har hunnit ta för er. Det finns kaffe och te, annars får ni ta det efteråt. Jag heter Isadora Hellegren. Jag är projektledare här på Internetstiftelsen för Goto 10. Och jag ska bara ta några ord här lite kort innan vi sätter igång med dagens föreläsning. Om det är första gången ni är här idag och vill lära er mer om Goto 10 eller generellt vill veta mer så får ni gärna gå in på goto10.se. Ni får även gärna bli medlemmar i Goto 10 Community på Facebook. Annars kan ni även ställa frågor till mig efter föreläsningen. Men jag tror att ni kanske har fler frågor till någon annan som är här idag. Sen ska jag ta några korta ord här nu för att introducera dagens föreläsare. Our speaker today <laughs> is professor, designer and architect who focuses on the intersection of artificial intelligence, architecture and design. She is associate professor at Carnegie Mellon's School of Design She holds a PhD in architecture from Princeton, an MA or master's from Yale in architectural history. She is also the author of Architectural Intelligence, how designers and architecture created the digital landscape. Today, she will be telling us more about this history of artificial intelligence architecture and design. Please join me in welcoming Professor Molly Wrightsteinson. It's great to be here. Um, wow, so many people. This is great. Good morning. Hi. Um, so uh, I did, uh, it was Thank you for the kind introduction. This is um, my book, Architectural Intelligence. Uh, it just came out, and there is <coughs> excuse me, a copy floating around that will go into the GoTo10 library. Anna Maria has it right there. Um, it just came out at the end of December, and it will be out on January 19th, shipping from Amazon UK. Um, I'm really excited it's finally out. <laughs> it was a lot of work. So what does artificial intelligence have to do with architecture or design? The answer is actually quite a bit. And I want to go over this. I'm going to jump back to this book in just a second to talk about how my own journey started on this question of AI. It came out of a footnote in a book by Christopher Alexander. But I'll get to that again in a second. So what does artificial intelligence have to do with architecture and design? Turns out, quite a lot. I want to point out that this is an old history, and um, it's a history that goes back a number of years. When we're talking about artificial intelligence, we're talking about a construct that was first coined in name in 1955 by John McCarthy, who described it as making machines do things that would require intelligence if done by man. And McCarthy, John McCarthy, brought together a group of researchers at Dartmouth College in the summer of 1956 to put together the platform for research for artificial intelligence, including things like perceptrons, machine learning, um, natural language processing, and game playing, a number of tenets of artificial intelligence research that are still in place today. We see people like these two gentlemen, who um, uh, uh, Herb Simon and Alan Newell, uh, you see them playing chess. And um, they were instrumental at Carnegie Mellon at my university, um, where they were, where Newell and Simon were both professors for many years. In 1958, they described the problems of artificial intelligence as just about solved. They just needed till the early 60s. They're going to be able to model the human brain. They wrote, intuition, insight, and learning are no longer exclusive possessions of human. Any large, high-speed computer can be programmed to exhibit them also. 1960, they were going to have it nailed down. In 
Speaking of 1960, this is J.C.R. Licklider, and I'm going to mention him a couple of other times uh, in, in this talk. J.C.R. Licklider wrote a piece called Man Computer Symbiosis in 1960 that outlined the platform and the way that we talked about interactivity for decades. And at this point, when we talk about human computer symbiosis in artificial intelligence and symbiotic modes of intelligence, we're actually hearkening back to something that he wrote in 1960. Um, and human computer symbiosis, he says, is, is going to involve a very close coupling between the human and the electronic members of the partnership. This is different than master slave descriptions of computation that were taking place at the time. And this is very important for some things that we're going to be talking about today in architecture and design. I told you that I would promise you collaborations. I want to point out that uh, JCR Licklider was a mentor to Nicholas Negroponte, who I will be talking about, the founder of the MIT Media Lab. Um, he was also the person who put in place the key personnel who would realize ARPANET in 1967 and effectively the beginning of the internet. He worked both at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, MIT, and also Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, which was a private defense contractor that's now owned by Raytheon. He sits at the center, or sat at the center, of the military-industrial complex. This is Marvin Minsky, who um, we, many of you may know, passed away at the end of 2016. He wrote a piece in 1961 and said that, I believe that we are on the threshold of an era that will be strongly influenced by and quite possibly dominated by intelligent problem-solving machines. And with the AI lab, he worked very closely with Nicholas Negroponte, who is an architect by training, to realize interfaces for artificial intelligence starting in the 1960s. So indeed, AI and architecture are not strangers. In fact, they're friends, and at that, old friends. But I think that sometimes when you look at the history of computing, you see people turning to architecture as a way to talk about what possibilities there are in the world for computation. This is an animated GIF of Douglas Engelbart giving the mother of all demos. The mother of all demos was in 1967. This is his demonstration of the NLS, the online system. It offered hyperlinking, um, it, it involved a mouse, it involved lists, it involved voice control, and um, it's called the mother of all demos because it, it really kind of was. So if you're not familiar with it, go watch it on YouTube. It's really, it's pretty extraordinary. And this is, of course, one of Douglas Engelbart's other inventions. This is the original mouse in 1964. Um, I love it. I just love what it's made of. Actually, I think this could probably be very successful today, maybe as an antidote for Apple's very clean aesthetic. But before the mother of all demos, in 1962, he wrote a paper called Augmented Human Intellect. And his very first example that he used to describe this computer system that he would eventually realize and demo in 1967 was that of an architect. And he described it as, let us consider an augmented architect at work. He sits at a working station that has a visual display screen, some three feet on a side. This is his working surface and is controlled by a computer with which he can communicate by means of a small keyboard and various other devices. And he goes on to describe a setup of different kinds of screens, right? And different programs that might run, different kinds of data that might be a part of the program. His description of this augmented architect at work preceded Sketchpad, the computer-aided design system that, uh, that Ivan Sutherland developed in 1962. So why does Douglas Engelbart turn to architecture? And I think it's because architecture is about building worlds. So let's talk about some architects who build worlds. Um, I will talk today about three architects. These are um, case studies that I include in my book. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Christopher Alexander, Cedric Price, and Nicholas Negroponte, all of whom are architects by training. Um, who's familiar with Christopher Alexander here? A little bit. There is an architect in the room. Uh, who's familiar with Cedric Price? <laughs> and who's, is anyone familiar with Nicholas Negroponte? Yeah, okay. Um, 
well, I'll go into who these people are and how they've actually influenced things outside of architecture and design um, in different kinds of ways. And I'm going to start with Christopher Alexander. Um, I showed you his book at the very beginning. He's why I got started on this journey. I will mention that technologists love Christopher Alexander and architects kind of hate him. He wanted to create what I see as an operating system for architecture over a long, long history, over a long arc of his career. He was interested in construing design and architecture as something that was intelligent and adaptive. And his theories about architecture and design upended and changed and challenged the design process and the role of people in that design process. So I showed you this book, 1964, Notes on the Synthesis of Form. That's actually his dissertation. And uh, A Pattern Language is 1977. Um, and this is the book for which he is best known. Um, this is, if you've heard of pattern languages, design patterns, patterns in software, I'll get to how we get from Christopher Alexander to those concepts. Christopher Alexander makes architects angry for a lot of reasons. One of them is he has always railed against the tendency of architects to be creative geniuses. And uh, in 1963, he wrote a book with Serge Shermayev. And um, I love this quote, monument and doghouse alike bear the dreadful imprint of self-appointed genius or just plain incompetence. He was a critical one. He is a critical one. He's still alive. But um, in this book, this is the book where he outlined a design system. Um, and he described it as every design problem begins with an effort to achieve fitness between two entities, the form in question and its context. His idea was that you could take all of the scattered particulars of a design problem chunk them together and figure out where to focus your attention. I'll show you some different ways that he did this and the different ways, the different disciplines he drew from in, in this book. <coughs> when I said at the beginning that he was interested in an operating system for order, this is where he starts. He starts, this is um, in the inscription in the uh, very front of the book. He starts with a quote from Phaedrus. And this is Phaedrus, uh, the, the section in Phaedrus where they're talking about rhetoric. This is the introduction of rhetoric. First, the taking in of scattered particulars under one idea so that everyone understands what is being talked about. Second, the separation of the idea into parts by dividing it at the joints as nature directs, not breaking any limb in half as a bad carver might. So he has Greek philosophy and drama. He also draws on other, um, a number of other disciplines, not only graph theory and set theory, um, but Darcy Wentworth Thompson's on growth and form, because he believed that you could, you could describe the forces within a design problem. And if you could describe the forces, the different things that are in tension with each other, then you could figure out the best way to solve that problem. And it could adapt and change over time as it needed to. He relied on principles of Gestalt psychology by Kafka, by Kurt Kafka, who is the, um, is the psychologist who said the whole is different than the sum of its parts. And then Ross Ashby's book, Design for a Brain. Ross Ashby was a British cyberneticist. He was a part of the Dartmouth conferences as well. And this. He also refers to John McCarthy and, uh, and um, Ross Ashby here and Marvin Minsky writing about artificial intelligence um, in a footnote. So this is the thing that in 2007 sent me down a rabbit hole that uh, I don't think I'm coming back up from anymore. And there you go. So over the course of, I don't know, I'd say a, a 15 year career, he kept trying different modes of organizing design problems in this operating system. First he started with the tree. And this is the way that I mentioned that he'd break down these, these uh, design particulars, these design requirements, and group them together in different kinds of ways. So here's the program of sets, and here's a realization of diagrams. If you could come up with a diagram to communicate the idea of the design problem, maybe designers would be less biased, he believed. 
Here's how you break down different kinds of requirements in a design problem. And for those of you who work in any way in software or system development, this is going to begin to look somewhat familiar to you. Here's they interrelate to each other. Um, and this is this notion of, um, of flexibility and adaptability tying into set theory and graph theory. He said, we may therefore picture the process of form making as the action of a series of subsystems, all interlinked yet sufficiently free of one another to adjust independently in a feasible amount of time. So if you'll notice here that nothing he is describing looks like a building. And he's not known for his buildings, although he did design buildings. It's not really centrally what he's thought of. He came up with a system for trying to figure out how you ameliorate and fix bad fit. But he was also interested in using a computer, and he's one of the very first architects to use one. Um, he had access to the computer, to the IBM 7090 um, at MIT. And this is not that particular IBM 7090, but it's from a film about the Mercury uh, spacecraft, and I think it's useful to see how this computer would be programmed and operated. Far to the north and east of Corpus Christi, sits the heart of the worldwide Mercury network, the computing and communication center that bonds it in... So you see this kind of strange, yeah, it looks like a telephone keyboard. Um, this strange back and forth, but what he wanted to do is he wanted to calculate complexity. And really what I think he wanted to do was play with the computer and see if he could make it work. He, he had a tree structure because the computer program he used, which he also used to design highway interchanges with a civil engineer uh, named Marvin Mannheim, resulted in tree structures because each node could have two vertices and that was all it could calculate. So therefore, all design problems needed to be trees. And in his book, he describes what these trees should be. So this is um, actually an example from the highway design structure um, that he was coming up with. And this would tell you how you should focus on a design problem. He applied it to other real life circumstances um, as a part of his group, the Center for Environmental Structure at UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. If you've ever taken the BART system, in the San Francisco Bay Area, he and his collaborators came up with 390 requirements for BART. And they would then be able to group these together and try to figure out the best way to design for BART's requirements. But then he upgraded his program. And he was able to develop semi-lattices, so more points of connection um, in, the, uh, in his in his graph theory, in his set theory, right? So instead of just two per node, now he can have many more. And this results in an open-ended system. And he wrote a, a piece called A City is Not a Tree. And this was a piece that um, around 2004 or so was um, picked up by a number of British interaction designers and interaction design schools um, as a way to talk about how things overlap with each other in the environment. So he gives an example of a street corner in Berkeley. There's the newspaper machine. There's the meter maid. There's the uh, parking meter. There's the drugstore. There's the change in your pocket, right? These interlapping, uh, overlapping and intersecting um, connections of people through cities. And so this was really beneficial and useful to people like Matt Jones and Matt Webb, the founders of Berg London, um, and a number of other, uh, Dan Hill, and a number of other urban scale interaction designers. What he tried to do here was, this is sort of what a semi-lattice looks like. This shows how the different elements of, of uh, Berkeley Street Corner might overlap. And then he tried to apply this to cities and figure out if any city was a semi-lattice. And, um, and they weren't. The only thing that he could come up with that would be a semi-lattice was a description of Karl Popper's open society, right? I think there's something very interesting that he was trying to do here because he fails at what he's trying to do. And he's failing at what he's trying to do with the computer. But I think there's a very important output, which is I think he was engaging in social network analysis at the scale of architecture. And there were similar experiments going on in the humanities and in the social sciences at the same time uh, to varying degrees of success. And I think this was his attempt to diagram architecture to social networking. But 
when Alexander has an idea that uh, he no longer likes, he throws it out the window and, and stomps all over it and is very vehement about it. And when he was done with trees and he was into semi-lattices, he said, the city is not, cannot, and must not be a tree. The city is a receptacle for life. If the receptacle severs the overlap of the strands of life within it because it is a tree, it will be like a bowl full of razor blades on edge, ready to cut up whatever is entrusted to it. In such a receptacle, life will be cut to pieces. If we make cities which are trees, they will cut our life to pieces. Yeah, I don't know if I'd want him on my architecture crits, but, but anyway. Eventually, he realizes the computer isn't going to do what he hopes for it to do. <clears throat> and instead, he wants to start realizing a network. And so he and his colleagues at the Center for Environmental Structure go away for a decade, and they start building out the notion of design patterns, patterns in architecture. And they realize this in a book called A Pattern Language. And then Alexander follows up with The Timeless Way of Building in 1979, which is his own philosophy and theory of how patterns work. And a pattern language is a network of patterns, 253 patterns from a very large scale to a small scale, and then the accompanying philosophy. And the 250 patterns sit in a hierarchy, um, like, like operating systems do. You need to have things in a certain order, in a sequence. Uh, this shows some of the larger size things. So up here you might have magic of the city, neighborhood boundary is a pattern name. Over here you have row houses. And these patterns will go down to the level of what you might put in your house, um, developing a sleeping nook, how big your balcony should be. <coughs> Excuse me. And as he described it, each pattern describes, or he and his co-authors, excuse me, each pattern describes a problem which occurs over and over again in our environment and then describes the solution to the core of the problem in such a way that you can use this solution a million times over without ever doing it the same way twice. Each pattern looks like this. There's a grammar, there's a headline. That ask, asterisk means they're very, they're very certain about this pattern. They also included patterns they weren't certain about as a point of discussion for improvement. There are sketches to describe what's going on, and then at the end of the pattern, they will relate it back to other um, patterns within the hierarchy. So if you were going to start a project, you might go through and find a pattern or two that spoke to you, and uh, then you'd choose the other ones that it relates to in the hierarchy, and when you put them together, any layperson would theoretically have the ideas in front of them of how to start their design project, their architecture project. I'll point out that architects tend to find this a little bit simplistic, um, and Alexander in many ways steps away from this later on, um, but it's still vastly, um, it's been vastly influential for a number of people. Um, this is how the network and the relationships work within the patterns. For instance, this is a description he gave from Timeless Way of Building. I find myself thinking of something like Paul Baran's network diagram from 1962 showing centralized, decentralized, and distributed networks, and Alexander's models here of visualization moving from the tree that's centralized to the decentralized uh, semi-lattice to the distributed pattern network. But there's something else about Christopher Alexander, which is that he, more than any other architect, has defined how programmers and digital designers talk about architecture. And there are a couple of examples to give. Um, Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham. Is anyone here familiar with Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham? OK, you will be in a second. Um, in 1987, they both were working on a project with, uh, in, within the small talk programming language, the object-oriented programming language. And they were trying to capture some details of user interface. And both of them had been fans of Christopher Alexander's books. They're expensive, so they'd go to the bookstore and read them a few pages at a time, and then go back and read them a few pages at a time. And uh, they thought, you know, maybe we should try and create patterns to capture and communicate what we're, what we're doing. So in 1987, that's what they did. Um, and it was, it was a runaway success of an idea. And um, then a group of, uh, of these four men 
wrote, they're, they're referred to as the Gang of Four, published a book called Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable uh, Object-Oriented Software in 1994. And a community began to grow around design patterns and software that directly was drawing from Christopher Alexander to the extent that I think there are some 1,200 books about design patterns in different kinds of technological settings uh, today. So um, Amazon shows me many, I see many, many here. But when I interviewed Kent Beck, and I'll mention that Kent Beck is one of the fathers of extreme programming and agile. Um, he said that what it is, is it's a rearrangement of the political power in the design and building process. And this is what is so appealing. A lot of, it's also worth noting that Kent Beck and uh, Alan Cooper, kind of one of the fathers of interface design, wanted to be architects until they realized they could do a lot more in software. And uh, they have this, I, they like being able to turn this upside down and how, uh, how it changes how design can be done. Um, Ward Cunningham is, of course, the inventor of the wiki format. And so when he started developing the wiki in 1994 and then porting it to the web in 1996, he was interested in Christopher Alexander's ideas of patterns, of a language that might keep growing and growing, of things that don't need to change and might be mutable, right? And so this is where he gets the inspiration from Christopher Alexander. And Alexander even got invited to talk to the Uppsala conference, the object-oriented programming conference in 1996. They brought him back. And uh, I'm sorry, I cut off the bottom here. But um, he, he thanked them, said, you know, I don't know much about computers, which is not true. Uh, and, and he said, you know, you, you kind of missed the point on the patterns. There's a moral component to them. But he also pointed out that these programmers and these engineers before him were people who were going to wield a lot of power in the world. He said, you almost can't name a facet of the world, which is not already to some very strong degree, under the influence of the programs that are being written to manage and control those entities or operations. And um, he begged them to think about the moral considerations of this. So visualization, patterns, politics, and power. That leaves us with Christopher Alexander. Um, his ideas also get picked up by Terry Winograd. Um, he's now an emeritus professor at Stanford. Um, he studied artificial intelligence and worked in the a AI lab at, uh, at MIT and um, started human-computer interaction at Stanford. And this is Mitch Kaper. And they took Alexander's ideas to apply them to HCI education and design education. This is from CHI 1990, CHI 90. Um, and they turned again to architectural metaphors and to Christopher Alexander as their architectural, um, as their architectural translator. Mitch Kaper talked about the critical role of design as a counterpart to programming, again viewed through an architecture studio model. And in a book that came out in 1996, and this is available, a lot of it is available online. It's a wonderful book called Bringing Design to Software. Um, Terry Winograd started thinking through this the way that people might inhabit a building. And it's an idea, again, that comes from Alexander's notions of architecture. And he said that software is not just a device with uh, which the user interacts. It's also the generator of a space in which the user lives. Software design is like architecture. When an architect designs a home or an office building, a structure is being specified. More significantly, though, the patterns of life for its inhabitants are being shaped. People are thought of as inhabitants rather than as users of buildings. So that's one set of interactions and connections. I will move a little bit quickly through the next, but I'd like to introduce you to Cedric Price. Um, Cedric Price died in 2003. He's um, one of the people I most wish I might have met in the world. Um, he's known for having different perspectives on architecture um, and getting architects and everyday people to think differently about it. Um, in fact, he's known for saying technology is the answer. But what was the question? say things like maybe you don't need maybe you don't need a new house maybe you need a divorce maybe you need a walk in the park he belonged to the demolition society as well as the royal institute of british architects um, staunch labor supporter best friends with conservative members of parliament and his life partner was eleanor braun who is the inspiration for the song eleanor rigby 
He was a character. Um, he's not known for building much because he didn't build very much. You might know the Snowden aviary if you've been to the London Zoo. He thought maybe you could put this structure down and maybe lift off the mesh. Maybe the birds would stay. Maybe they wouldn't. It's not the point. Architecture isn't about fixity. Architecture is about challenging people and about changing and uh, supporting changing in changes in condition. The piece of work that he's best known for, again, not built, in fact, I'm going to show you lots of things that weren't constructed, is the Fun Palace, which he developed with radical theater director Joan Littlewood. Joan Littlewood was a protege of Bertolt Brecht. And it's a cybernetic space that was movable, mobile, could, um, could have escalators moving around or pieces moving around, could be used for leisure, theater, learning, um, whatever you might want to do. Huge mobile gantry crane on the outside could go back and forth, sort of like on a container ship, and move around parts of the architecture. He employed a 27-person cybernetic committee, including Stafford Beer and Gordon Pask. And this is one of the cybernetic diagrams for the building. Input of unmodified people, actual network, output of modified people. So the idea was the building would learn from the users and try to adapt f to them, and they would be changed by interacting with the building. Um, a lot of these ideas came from their collaboration with Gordon Pask. Um, and Gordon Pask is um, the founder of Conversation Theory, Second Orbiter Cyberneticist, and he worked very closely with different architects and designers, including with the Architecture Machine Group and Nicholas Negroponte. And he was about upending and changing over the politics of how design could work. Maybe the computer is what challenges the user or the designer. Maybe it turns things on its head. So this is another unbuilt project from uh, Cedric Price called Generator. It's a set of 12 foot by 12 foot cubes on, uh, on a territory in, uh, on, a, a, on a big site in um, Georgia. And it was an arts retreat center. So there'd be walkways and boardwalks and barriers. And you could use it for whatever purposes you'd want. He wanted you to move around or request changes to be made to generators. So you could use it to suit your needs. Um, he realized he'd need to come up with a set of what he called menus so that there could be some possible layouts for generator when it started. Um, I like these. These are from the Canadian Center for Architecture, uh, Cedric Price Archive, but I like this. Excellent, full of event and taught action. Here's a, a sketch of his of the mobile crane moving the cubes of generator around. Here's how it would come together. And then people could use it. But then he realized that it was unlikely that people were going to probably make enough changes to Generator. And this is how he got in touch with John and Julia Fraser, who were both uh, computer scientists as well as architects, to work on a set of uh, microcontrollers and programs for Generator. I want to point out that this is 1978. Um, when he gets in touch with them. And John and Julia suggest that they will put microcontrollers on every piece of generator so that it would be possible to run an inventory program to know where all the, pro where all the pieces are at one time, a rules program so you could know what you could do with the different pieces, um, a intelligent design program so you could pick up and move these, what this is called the intelligent beer mat, move these plexiglass cubes and then it would plot out here and here, and the most important program, the boredom program. And if Generator hadn't been turned around or it hadn't been redesigned for enough time, Generator would start redesigning its own layouts and hand them off to uh, Wally Prince, who was to be operating the crane. And in a letter to Cedric, John wrote, if you kick a system, the very least you would expect it to do is kick us back. And this is this uh, handwritten postscript. You seem to imply that we were only useful if we produced results that you did not expect. I think this leads to some definition of computer aids in general. At least one thing that you would expect from any half-decent program is that it should produce at, le at least one plan that you did not expect. I love this notion of intelligence, that actually what it should do is that it should kick you back. Um, and so, indeed, this was one of the first, um, this is considered to be one of the first proposals for an intelligent building.
Um, but part of this came from the fact that Gordon Pask himself in 1953 created something called um, the Musicolor Machine, which was a set of lights and mobiles that you'd have to dance and play music with, and if it got bored of you, bored of you it would stop interacting with you. So this idea shows up again and again in his work. But we also see it in contemporary work. Um, this is, I'm going to just play a brief video from Madeline Gannon's Mimas project. Madeline is defending her PhD next week at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and she wasn't aware, interestingly enough, she wasn't aware of the boredom programs from uh, John Fraser and Cedric Price. But when everything comes together and you're in the space with the robot and you just have a very raw experience with this animal-like machine responding to your every need, all the technical aspects sort of melt away into the background. It's incredibly important to have opportunities and spaces to come in and experiment and misuse these existing technologies. I love that. So she's another person in this long history of how can we open it up, misuse it, play with it, <clears throat> and learn different ways that might highlight who we are in relationship to, uh, to robots. So with Cedric Price, we see responsiveness and generativity and something else that I really love. This is a later talk he gave where he said something about darkness and doubt in designing for pleasure. Designing for delight and pleasure should very seldom be seen to happen and must encompass, indeed, nurture, doubt, danger, mystery, and magic. And one final thing, Cedric Price donated his library to uh, the, the Canadian Center for Architecture, and um, he's known for writing in his books. And so when I pulled his copy of uh, Nicholas Negroponte's book, Being Digital, I discovered that Cedric had written in it, good, but dated, <laughs> in 1995. So this guy, Nicholas Negroponte, um, is, of course, the founder of the MIT Media Lab. He uh, dedicated his first book, The Architecture Machine, to the first machine that can appreciate the gesture. And there are always a lot of gestures there. He's always got his hand in the picture. <coughs> and before the Media Lab existed, the Architecture Machine Group um, operated from 1967 to 1984 when it folded into the MIT um, Media Lab and became the first, became four of the first 11 labs there. Um, there he worked very closely, as I mentioned, with people like J.C.R. Licklider, Marvin Minsky, Seymour Papert. Um, the Architecture Machine Group was half architects and half engineers. And they, they believed in demo or die. They believed, by, they believed in bricolage, um, hacking, making things, and putting things together to see what, what could, could come to be. Um, they were also heavily funded by the Department of Defense, as, were a lot of, as was a lot of research in artificial intelligence at the time, and followed the same funding imperatives of, um, of AI research. One of the first projects that the lab did was called Urban 5. Again, it's a set of cubes. It's a set of design tools. But this is actually a conversational user interface for urban design. And um, the user would select a cube, um, use these buttons here to assign certain attributes to them, and then have a question and answer dialogue here with them. Is anyone here developing conversational user interfaces or chatbots? They're hard, right? Yeah, they were hard then, too, and they, this was a disaster. It was a failure. Um, I love this. Ted, many conflicts are occurring. You can almost imagine Hal 9000's voice. And um, as Negroponte wrote, you know, he celebrated the failure of this and said it printed garbage, but at least it was friendly garbage. <laughs> we learn over and over that designing for conversation is really, really hard. Again, Information Processing Technology Office and then the Office of Naval Research. Um, one individual there, a guy named Marvin Denikoff, almost single-handedly outlined the funding imperatives for artificial intelligence in the United States, period. He was a civilian, also a playwright, and when he retired, he joined the MIT Media Lab in their experimental theater program. 
We've mentioned Marvin Minsky a couple of times, and here we see this robotic stacking arm and a video eye. Um, this is a, a lot of research, <coughs> excuse me, in artificial intelligence took place in micro worlds. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a bit of a cold. Microworlds are bounded worlds. They're also called blocks worlds, right? Because you could focus on a specific aspect of a technological or design problem. So we're finding the edges in a cube or manipulating a robot to stack the cubes. Um, and the problem about blocks worlds is they don't scale up. And after 1974, they stopped funding research into blocks worlds. But in 1970, the Architecture Machine Group created a project called Seek. And this was a part of the software show at the Jewish Museum. You recognize some of the technologies from, the, uh, from Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert. And if you look closely here, you'll see um, some residents of this little world. And it's, uh, you see some gerbils. And it says, gerbils match wits with computer-built environment. And in this blocks world, Seek would try to stack up blocks, and the gerbils would move the blocks around as gerbils do. So this is the, the center gatefold of, the, of uh, the software show catalog. There's a wonderful essay there by Jack Burnham in which he quotes Ted Nelson, who says, our bodies are hardware and behavior software, our behavior software. The software show is a disaster. Um, it almost bankrupted the Jewish Museum. Many of the com computational projects didn't work. And Seek was a disaster, too. It tended to kill the gerbils. <laughs> there's a, there's, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but, but I think there is something to be said there for the questions of how we model systems, how we model intelligence, and what happens when we scale them up to the size of uh, living beings and worlds. Negroponte understood the darkness and, um, and the possibility, I think, of what he was experimenting with. Um, he had provocative thoughts about what it was to design the input-output devices. He was it, eternally frustrated with, um, with computational gear, right? And he suggested that focusing on our bodies should be one point of departure in artificial intelligence. And he suggests maybe that a machine might need to have a body like ours um, in order to ex and experience behaviors like ours to share in what he calls artificial intelligence and intelligent behavior. So I find these provocations that he published in his second book, Soft Architecture Machines, to be useful even today. They started developing command and control environments. This is along the lines of what other, uh, other um, imperatives were in the AI lab at that time. If you wanted to get funding, you needed to be doing something that was going to have an explicit applied battlefield application. Um, Aspen Movie Map was a, a um, early example of remote sensing. They put movie cameras on a Jeep, drove it through Aspen, Colorado, shot film, put the images on a video disc, a big silver video disc. They had a prototype video disc player. And here, um, the user would sit in this media room, this dark, carpeted, quiet room. Computer rooms in 1979 were very, very loud. This is quiet, very big screen in front of you, touch screen here and here, and you would be sitting in an iconic Eames lounge chair with joysticks. And you'd zoom down the streets of Aspen, Colorado in a kind of proto Google Street, Street View experience. And this was actually funded because of um, of a need to do battlefield and hostage simulation, uh, rescue simulations after a terrorist attack on an Israeli jet. Projects like Mapping by Yourself, this is a picture from the cover, start suggesting augmented reality and also digital maps. Di the, um, this window is the first digital layered map. It also proposed audio feedback, force feedback, and two and a half and 3D mapping. Yeah. That was what? Yeah. I did not realize that. Ah. Oh. Oh, thank you. 
that's also, and also, this is the second time I've, I've talked about this building in 24 hours with someone, so this is, ah, oh, thank you. So um, this device, I also am struck by what you see in the background, an IBM Selectric typewriter, uh, a push-button phone, a dictaphone. And then there are projects like Put That There, which um, use that, that involving media room to do gestural interfaces and voice interfaces in a manner of abstraction. Um, and here's a demo of it. <laughs> Note the lounge chair. <laughs> so they're abstracting various things here, right? Um, and they actually did continue to realize this. This is, uh, if you have read the MIT Media Lab book by Stuart Brand, he refers to this as the put that there room, the media room, and um, they continued to realize this device. It was for ship fleet management, as you can see. So. Architecture Machine Group interfaces to AI and defense funding, but also an understanding of, uh, of what was both thrilling and shocking about what it was to work in this world. Um, Negroponte wrote, the fantasies of an intelligent and responsive physical environment are too easily limited by the gap between the technology of making things and the science of understanding them. I strongly believe that it is very important to play with these ideas scientifically and um, and explore applications of machine intelligence that totter between being unimaginably oppressive and unbelievably exciting. The MIT Media Lab became, well, the Architecture Machine Group became the MIT Media Lab. Uh, Negroponte is still involved with it. He runs one laptop per child. A number of these people are still involved there, too. So as I conclude, I have some questions. If AI's ideas are so old, why do we talk about them like they're so new? AI is the new black, it's the new UI, it's the next digital frontier, AI is the new electricity, AI is a, a big online university for learning about AI, AI is uncanny, <coughs> future of computer is the mind of a toddler. Google's AI is a new paradigm that unites humans and machines. I highlighted the word new here just to, to capture it. And I th one of those is a New York. But I think there are five or six uses of the word new in, uh, in the first two paragraphs. And then Elon Musk, of course, declaring that this is an era, a new era of artificial intelligence. So I hope that something's clear, which is that AI isn't the new anything because it isn't new. But there's a lot at stake in claiming that there is. Things like funding, and for that matter, defense funding. Capital and profit, cachet, power. Agendas, the future, the past. Oprah. <laughs> President Oprah. <laughs> 
And cliches really do only go so far. These problems are really hard to solve, how we challenge machines, users, programmers, designers, architecture. I think AI needs architecture, AI needs design, and AI needs us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm. Um, oh, there you are. <laughs> I could hear your voice. Um, I'm here with a microphone too, but thank you so much for thank this you. fantastic presentation. It was really lovely. I assume that the audience might be filled with questions. Uh, they're saying that I'm here with the microphone <laughs> because if we all want to hear those questions and if we want to have them on the video we're sending live, you need this. So I have a first question here. First of all, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. Okay. It's really great, it's full of a lot of insights. I have a question about uh, when we bridge uh, digital architecture and physical architecture. Mm -hmm. Personally, as a researcher, I met one big problem, time. We have different time perception. Uh, when you build something, you, you can spend years to yeah. design new material, physical yeah. material. And if you want to test like soft, it sometimes takes seconds. Yeah. And this uh, time perception is quite huge gap between these two kind of, let's call it, mentalities. Uh, can you tell more how you fix this? <laughs> uh, maybe problem, maybe challenge, maybe opportunity? It's funny because I'm here because of a dissertation defense at KTH that is taking on that very issue in a, a very interesting theoretical way. And that basically uh, states that the production of space and architecture is a Turing machine, which is, I'm ner What? Ah. Yeah, it's tomorrow. Yeah, I'm the opponent. So, <laughs> yeah, Pablo, Pablo Miranda uh, Carranza's dissertation, he's got a very interesting theorization of exactly that question. But um, there, you know, it keeps coming up in a lot of ways, and a couple places I might name. Uh, I mean, one person is Rem Koolhaas, who spent the 90s and early 2000s co opting the language of dot com everything, and now. Uh, He's grumpy about it, and he wants uh, the dot-com world and, and Silicon Valley to stop taking architecture's metaphors. Um, he points out that architecture is really a long game, right? It's a, a long process. Um, so we see it show up there. And then there are architects like Erin Breslin. Um, she's at SciArc, and she's someone who is dealing with a different notion, which is um, prototyping architecturally at a one-to-one -one scale. And what that comes to mean um, for the architect from, from her perspective. And um, she's done some really interesting work around that. She's also doing work with robotics. Um, and so she's, she's another person to look at. But those are just three things off the top of my head. But you're right. It's, it's difficult to bridge the physical and digital. And one of there's other things I didn't talk about in the book, like the history of information architecture and architectures of information and ways that architecture has been construed as an informational process um, that have been attempts to try to do that, too. Thank you for that excellent Thanks. question. We have one here. Uh, so we are not sitting very far from the, the Minecraft uh, office, the guys that developed <laughs> Minecraft. <laughs> and I was thinking, uh, how, how have you seen uh, Minecraft uh, kind of impact on architecture? You know, um, it's funny, I can't remember who, but somebody wrote a really nice article. It might have actually, no, it was Bjarke Ingels, and he wrote about Cedric Price would have really liked Minecraft. <laughs> um, but I can't, I can't speak directly about it, but I do think that the affordances of cubes are a funny thing that come up time and time again. And, uh, you know, one thing, if you have ever watched a child play Minecraft, is they, they love the 8-bitness of it and, uh, and the blockiness of it. So it's, it's kind of fascinating. So I don't have a, a more exact response. But I also didn't realize we were near their offices. Thank you. Who else? Oh, we have several questions. Um, as we move towards smart cities, hmm. a lot of the uh, devices, machines there, don't see the world like human beings because they have different sensors. How yep. do we cope with that? And maybe that is a different type of artificial intelligence because what machines see will be based on 
their own senses which are not the same as ours. Absolutely. So how do we cope with that? That's a good question. And I think I might let it stand as, as a question and as a statement. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I was just wondering regarding that with symbiosis between computers and man. Mm -hmm. Like, when do you think that will happen, or do you think that will happen, and or will they always be either we as slave masters, or like, will there be ever like the true symbios symbiosis with machines and man? Makes you wonder whether it's already happened um, in different kinds of ways. One thing I. I will say is my colleague and friend, Daniel Cardoso Jacques, wrote a really fantastic book called Builders of the Vision. And it's about the, it's about that question of um, symbiosis on one hand and thinking of computer-aided design systems as master-slave systems. What he points out is when those systems were developed, they also um, basically are demonstrations of a philosophy of creativity that get built into the scene, in, into the machine. Um, and so if you believe that a computer should be the slave to a human master, that's Stephen Coons' terminology. Uh, Douglas Ross had a different um, perspective on it. And um, these, these various ideas are the foundation of what we still do when we're, when we're using computers to design. So um, what I would say is, I, I completely did not answer your question. <laughs> but but what I would say is, you know, you could question whether the symbiosis of us and our, our mobile devices or um, pervasive conversational interfaces, um, Siri, Cortana, and so on, whether that's an attempt to do that. Then again, I also realize that rem toilets with the flushing sensor always flush when you're not ready for them to do it. And I sometimes wonder about the fidelity of these systems we're designing. Yeah. Uh, but then I was thinking, Rick, um, do you think the, the symbiosis will be that they will get out of, will they get out of being of use, like they have their own purpose? I mean, if you think Siri has the purpose of being helping or being the almost slave yeah. AI. Is that symbiosis or? You know, I, I don't want it to be. And I know that what will suit the interests of, of capitalism and profit will be whatever gets, um, whatever gets Apple, Amazon, and Google as much of my and your data as possible. Um, yeah. On the other hand, one of the things that I like and, and with some of the examples that I've wanted to show today are to show a different kind of way. Um, I'm, uh, there's a design firm in Malmö called Unsworn and uh, Magnus Torst Torstensen, when he was a student at the Interaction Design Institute Ivrea, had a set of projects around um, like things that, he called them digital peacock tails. And they were messy, ugly digital things, and they included the the um, the uncalculator. I think that's what it was called, and it would mostly calculate right, and, and sometimes not. And what I like about these questions is I think they actually cause us to pause and say, where do we start? Where does it? Where does the machine stop? Where do we start? And what are those relationships? You know, it's not always an assistant. Maybe they have an attitude. Maybe they kick back. Katya. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for a really fascinating account. Um, I, uh, it was interesting, you mentioned when you mentioned Christopher Alexander yeah. that architects sort of tends to have a skeptical attitude. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, it's super interesting because it's, I mean, it has to do with the provocations that he's posing by saying, you know, this is something that can be, if we can just define the pattern language, the layman can actually take mm. power over. Uh, the design and uh, so it's a, it's a, it's very much a question of um, uh, the architectural uh, sort of ego uh, yeah. uh, authorship questions right. like to 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 be able to play this genius and to actually hold the control of yeah. of, of uh, the artistry and uh, uh, and the, the example Cedric Price I think is is quite liked <laughs> yeah. Maybe because of the fun palace and yeah. so forth but it's interesting these uh, these pioneers that you're mentioning and then in the end you're saying you know ai needs architecture 
Um, and I think it's, it's interesting that there is a history in architecture of also a very, very strong conservatism. Mm-hmm. Uh, and formalism. All the attempts to be, to be uh, these pioneers are sort of sometimes liked, sometimes uh, not liked. Yeah. And the discipline is kind of still uh, working on in the old uh, ways of working, uh, which is also something that Pablo's thesis is, is, is talking Very about. Very much. But uh, so when AI meets architecture today, you mentioned some examples. I think it's a kind of ongoing history of uh, interaction between yep. architecture and the and the digital, and so forth. We have lots of interesting examples. Yep. But do you say do you see that we have these kind of future pioneers today? If like where we are now, if we in like thirty years time right. we talk about the like the twenty twenty eighteen, uh, uh, do we have these? pioneers still coming from architecture that are not always architecture um i think that the this formalist streak in architecture that started in the late 1980s with deconstruction and um was very much the the operative architecture school culture on the american east and west coast um i mean i say this having eisenman and in one of these places, although it should be said that Eisenman and Alexander, for as much as they, as Alexander, as Eisenman hates Alexander, um, they're very, very similar to one another. Um, Sean Keller has written about some really great stuff about that. Um, I think that I've always been surprised about architecture's ambivalence about the internet, um, and and now things are a little bit different. But still, a decade ago, there wasn't much going on with fun with Arduino boards and architecture schools and, and ways to interact. And in the experiences I had, even in master's studios at, at Princeton, run by Elizabeth Diller, there, the, the notion of smart and dumb was so naive. Like, it, it seems like you, what you need to do is you have to have, and this will be very oriented toward Pablo's dissertation too, that you have to have the tools, the materials for um, interaction in the hands of architects so they can think of it as a material to design with and not just as a facade and not just as blinking lights and not just as a million very bad internet of things or smart city metaphors that get badly exercised and we find ourselves shrugging and saying what could possibly go wrong? And then we talk about gerbils. (laughs) So. so I am very curious about how there might be, I, I think now architectural education is changing to begin to take on some of this, this territory that interaction designers have taken on. Um, there have been a lot of interaction designers who want to do urban scale interaction design because architects weren't stepping up to it. So, um, so I think that, that those are questions. Um, Future pioneers, maybe. There's there's a group of buddies, and I will now get to include Pablo, I hope, is in this group, that I call the Cabal. And <laughs> I'd like to recruit everybody to the Cabal. And uh, I, think, I think it's so, it's, it's, uh, it's fantastic that your book is coming out now, because thank I think you. this is so important also for the architecture community to kind of understand. And like, okay, we're I part of this. It, it, Architecture was absolutely central for the foundation of interaction design. Um, certainly, you know, you could look at the work of someone like Phil Tabor and his his long, long marriage with Gillian Crampton Smith, his um, partner and collaborator, and knowing where Phil has been throughout the history of computer aided design, the history of architecture, handing out archigram on the Cambridge campus, you know. And then Gillian Crampton Smith founded the Interaction Design Institute Ivrea and the Computer Related Design Program, des- Interaction Design Program at um, at the Royal College of Art in London. This is absolutely vital for the history of what we do interactiv- interactively. It's vital for the history of physical computing, and that's where it comes from. Yeah. You may. It's going to be quite short. Uh, so I'm doing my PhD in the area of uh, buildings, digital twins mm-hmm. and virtual environment. And uh, we explore how we can uh, really design uh, virtual spaces for different purposes. And my question is for you, as far as game industry is so mm. successful, people like to be in uh, virtual worlds, fictive sure. worlds, uh, world building and so on. Do you think we will spend more time in virtual spaces in the future, personally? 
yes, but not as a replacement for for real space. Um, and I'm curious about the different ways that things will play out. Um, it is still weird to see someone with a VR headset interacting with the world. Um, augmented reality or uh, mixed reality has other kinds of affordances right now that could be useful. But again, you know, some of these ideas about VR, there's a history of the architecture machine group and the history of VR um, that overlap with one another in the early media lab as well, um, as well as the research of, of um, things like Atari, as in the maker of the 2600. Their, their research group in 1980 was looking into virtual reality too. So these are very long-standing questions that now have become possible. One of the things in Europe that's maybe going to be quite interesting is the conflict between the requirements of a smart city mm -hmm. and snooping on people's information and privacy. So we have this, which is not worked out yet, how, how far will privacy stop the trawling of personal information for all this big machine data and a AI use? Yeah. So that will be quite interesting to see how maybe what, what do you think of that, how that's going to play? Well, I'd, I'd add something else to it, and um, specific to artificial intelligence, the necessity of disclosing what's in the black box. New regulations, I think, in Europe that are saying you have to explain what's going on, what the, the AI is doing. Sometimes we don't know what the AI is doing. I don't know that the ordinary person actually needs to know what's in the black box, but we do need modes of transparency in data collection and in what algorithms are doing. Um, and these are, th these are ways where code plays out at the, at the scale of cities um, and where you know, machine learning plays out at the scale of cities, but um, not, not as buildings, but rather as policy. Um, you, know, you could look at how good the United States seems to be at killing unarmed black men uh, during police stops, and uh, you could consider what that means to how you shape a city and choose to move through a city if you are um, an African-American man, for instance. You know there are certain places you're not going to go because you're going to get pulled over every time you do. So, um, so there's a question of data collection, there's a question of transparency, um, and there's a question of these effects, I think, on the city itself. Um, could the machine kicking back with unexpected designs be like a Turing test for true symbiosis? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you entail what, what would that look like from an Ooh. architecture point of view? I don't know if I want to entail it. I think I want you to entail it. <laughs> <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds like you have an idea and like you're thinking about this. Uh, yeah, I'm a computer scientist who's looking at a similar topic. Huh. Um, so I'm at a point where uh, we have designs of large-scale systems from humans, and then I want to kind of replicate it with reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what that comparison would look like yeah. to an architect. I don't know. I don't know, but I, I, I want to ponder the question. Would it be sufficient to, uh, for them to be similar? Would you consider uh, differences in the design as something valid? I think differences would be good. Yeah. Um, you know, in the various accounts of Christopher Alexander talking about the, the early computer system, mm -hmm. the seven, IBM 7090 programs he was using, mm -hmm. he described those programs as intelligent because they produced consistent results. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for him in 1963, that's mm -hmm. what intelligence is. Mm -hmm. And in 1976, we have, or 79, we have different is intelligent or other is intelligent. There's um, something I included in the, the internet at Internet Dagana, which is um, I, I love collecting things that people do with neural nets mm -hmm. and nothing can reduce me to tears of laughter faster than things that neural nets do. Janelle Shane's work and uh, her paint colors and Wikipedia article names and but I think there's something about these differences that on one hand help us to better understand who we are as humans um, and help us to figure out what these weird machine creatures are. The work of Madeline Gannon mm -hmm. 
Um, Madeline's interesting. She is an architect by training. She's got a master's in architecture and she's got a PhD next week in architecture. But she's, she's also a human, um, a human centered designer. Mm -hmm. And she is interested in seeing what we learn about the robot as a creature. She views it, she has a, a, a heartfelt relationship with that robot. She's exploring affect. And so, you know, that's another mode of difference. And she is an architect playing with an industrial robot in the Design Museum in London. Sounds great. I look forward to her work. Oh, she's so <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, um, it's clear that we are standing in front of a lot of big questions for <laughs> the future. Many of these questions remain not new, as you have clearly pointed out. They have been around for a long time. What we know that it, it today also that it really helps to look back also, to learn from our history, to understand the context in which certain notions have developed, evolved, and how we have constructed them together through uh, various disciplines and collaborations. And with that, uh, we will try to conclude this now today. You're very welcome to still stick around, have another coffee, cool. talk to each other, and enjoy the space here. And once again, a big thank you to Molly. Thank you. Coming. This is awesome.